Dr. Hurd, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'd love to, to jump right in and I would love to know your thoughts on what marijuana exactly does to the brain when it's ingested. Ooh, that is a complex question, but just on a basic level. So marijuana um, consists of many components and the cannabinoids, and we can talk about those like THC, when we consume it, the, it will bind to our endogenous cannabinoid receptors. And those receptors on different cells will change activity of those cells. And you know, when we think, for me as a neuroscientist, um, what it does is that it can, for example, impact on our acutely on our working memory, our motor coordination, but the cannabinoid receptors are throughout our bodies. So, you know, so there are many different things that it 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 it, it can impact when we consume it. But in large part, also, you know, the reason why people take it recreationally is that it can make people, you know, feel quote unquote relaxed depending on the amount, rewarding, high, you know, euphoria. And so do you believe that, and when we're talking about marijuana, I guess we're talking about THC specifically, um, do you think that it has the ability to change people's brains over time if the use is strong enough? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of the research that I did in, initially in terms of how I got started in looking at cannabis and in particular THC. So when, when indeed, when we talk about cannabis from, especially from an addiction perspective, we're talking about THC. Since we know that's a cannabinoid, as I said, you know, is associated with the reward, the high. We can see that repeated use of cannabis and especially high potency cannabis, meaning high concentrations of THC, does change the brain. And it changes the brain in different ways. So it can change how the activity of the cells it can change the structure of the cells, actually the morphology of those cells and the connectivity of how, you know, different, our brains were, are obviously, are never silent. And that connection between different cells and different brain regions, cannabis can um, impact on that, um, even not just on the short term, but we see it even long term. And that's where some of my studies looking at, like the developmental effects of cannabis, where we study the brains much later after their initial um, cannabis use. What have you found on the developmental brain? Like what has the research suggested as far as like kids who, who smoke marijuana that has a lot of THC in it? Like what have you found that happens to their brains like later on in life? Yeah. So I was saying, you know, one of the reasons I went down this path to start with a crazy path was this, you know, this, the old adage of like this gateway hypothesis, like, you know, if you smoke cannabis as a teen, you're going to end up, you know, going to other addictive or hard drugs later on. But I just wanted to know, was there a neurobiological issue, um, aspect to that? Because of course, you know, there were a lot of debates and there still is. And so using our animal models where we can get, you know, really control all the variables with humans that make it challenging to interpret some of the human data, when we give THC to, say, our rat models as adolescents and then study them later in adults, we could see that they were much more sensitive to opioids, so they would self-administer more opioids. They showed greater impairment of decision-making, risky behavior, especially if they were re-exposed to, to THC again in adulthood. And we could also compare that in our to human um, to adults who have a cannabis use disorder and see that there were very similar things in their decision making, their risk of behavior, their impulsivity, and so the developmental effects we could uh, in terms of the adolescent exposure to THC and especially high dose THC, we could see also increase their sensitivity to stress. So you know, so it's not that. Animals and people go around looking, quote unquote, for lack of another word, crazy, just because they had adolescent exposure to THC. Often it's what happens to them in their lives. So there are changes in the stress responsivity so that, yes, they're going around normally, but they encounter certain stress. And then they showed much greater um, impulsivity with that or risky behavior changes in their decision making their reward sensitivity and we could even see that their stress hormone this 
the corticosterone or cortisol levels in humans was much more elevated. We could also see that it impacts on the activity of certain cells in the brain. And so we know that it has a long lasting effect, even if the person, um, you know, did not um, use the cannabis again for a long while. So would you say the the main danger of kids who are using a high potency or high or using marijuana that contains a lot of THC, the main danger is that it impacts their um, ability to manage and deal with stress. And then so later on down the road, they've trained their brain to deal with stress using a substance. And then once more stress happens, once that substance, you know, the the novelty or the high kind of wears off, they're now forced to go into something more severe, such as opiates, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, it's not a one-to-one that the person is going to go in and start, you know, using heroin and become addicted to heroin because of that. But you said it perfectly in the context of a lot of our uh, patients with a cannabis use disorder, they will tell us they they use it for dealing with their anxiety. But all the data shows that the more they use, the more they exacerbate and they worsen their anxiety disorder, the less they're able to actually deal with stress. So they are inadvertently worsening the damage. And the higher the THC content that they use, the more their brains change in a manner that you can say limit how the buffer that they have to deal with stress, to cope. And then they go back to the drug because then they're like, oh, this had helped, but it helps acutely. And I think people mistake intoxication for anti-anxiety, you know, that it's actually not alleviating their anxiety. They're just getting intoxicated and they're two different things. But I will also say, even in our animal models, there are behavioral traits, personality traits that actually not everybody who gets exposed to THC will develop certain things that we see later on. We're still trying to understand, you know, obviously that individual differences, but in large part, um, you know, we do see that this greater sensitivity to reward, not being able to buffer stress as much, being much more anxiety sensitive, also, you know, cognition being impacted, especially under those conditions. Not to not to play the blame game, but I'm I'm trying. I would love to just try to get your thoughts to help my audience maybe understand, like, you know, who's m- more at risk for developing cannabis use disorder, who's more at risk for developing some sort of addiction to cannabis that could result in potential psychosis and stuff. Have you found that, based on the data that you've seen, maybe people you've talked to, have you found that the, the environment? will determine whether or not somebody becomes addicted to cannabis, or do you believe it's like the substance, high potency THC in itself? Yeah. I mean, one of the things, I, again, most of the data epidemiologically, even in preclinical animal studies, is that the earlier you're exposed, the higher the, the concentration of THC and the frequency of use, the increased frequency, they do increase your vulnerability. Just like cannabis for other substances of abuse as well, cannabis is no different, meaning environment does matter. So we do see that individuals that had, you know, traumatic early life events, they are much more vulnerable to later, you know, cannabis use disorder. But you see that, as I said, with other substances. And it, for me, it, it, it pains my heart because, you know, the, abuse or the trauma that a lot of children may experience that gets encoded obviously into cells that then makes them much more vulnerable. And it comes back again to this whole aspect of stress sensitivity. But there are many people who also, you know, experience a similar um, environment who do not go on to develop a cannabis use disorder, even if they may be exposed to cannabis. But there are other things often in their lives that can buffer some of that. And so, you know, the question for us is, again, the individual differences of why certain individuals may be able to be more resilient, overcome some of those stressors, 
but the environment definitely plays plays a really huge uh, uh, is a really huge factor that together with perhaps aspects of genetics when we think about people who are you know develop psychosis but even with the psychosis we see this increased frequency um, or incidence now of psychosis but it's linked a lot to the potency of the THC so in Europe they've done you know I I take Europe more than the US where US is definitely much more cannabis available but even in Europe if, yes it's growing but there you could see and really track that the increased THC potency they showed in you know different cities um, increased psychosis in in young people even if you may not have quote unquote a genetic risk so it's this multifactorial complex aspect of the environment THC potency and that people are getting exposed to this high potency THC younger. And the younger you are, the greater the vulnerability to develop these the cannabis use disorder. What percentage of marijuana these days that most of these kids is consuming, like what percent of it is um, THC based compared to like 20, 30 years ago? The cannabis today is nothing compared to the cannabis 20, 30, even 10 years ago. I don't, I, and uh, definitely nothing compared to the original plant. And, and that's one of the things when people tell me, oh, you know, this is organic, it's natural. It has been a plant that has been um, modified tremendously. So, for example, the THC content in today's cannabis is around, like, depending on, I go for the lowest, like 15 to 24% and higher. The original plant was like 2%, it went to 4%. And then, and this kept on um, getting higher. But it's not just the flower that's that's the issue. Now there are many more ways in which people consume cannabis. So you know, yes, the, the old days, the bongs and so on. But you have these vapes, you have these shatters, these these isolates that can be even seventy to ninety percent THC. That is not quote unquote, your grandfather's <laughs> cannabis. It is not. It's not even your mother's cannabis. And that is the problem. People think that it's the same. And that's why we're seeing greater psychiatric vulnerability in young people than we did before. Because the question is, why didn't you see this before? You see this more, this incidence of greater psychiatric vulnerability, greater addiction vulnerability, because the plant and the products in which people are consuming them has changed dramatically. So they're getting very, very high potent um, THC in their brain. What's so alluring um, to kids about marijuana today, given the fact that you know you're, you're sharing what you've shared? I've heard other people share similar information that you know marijuana today isn't the marijuana that it, it was ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years ago, and it's in fact quite it's a lot more dangerous than it used to be, but yet it seems like a lot of these kids have no fear and they're just doing it anyway. Like, why is it so appealing to them? You know, it's a combination, I think, of so many things. I think, you know, teens, just the nature of teens, you, if someone tells you this is bad, you're going <laughs> to go and, you know, um, want to check it out for yourself. They don't trust, right? And and I think that that's, you know, a part of the adolescent brain but it's also that our society today, we're much more of a drug society and also the availability, um, you know, it's everywhere. And, and you know, social media, every, every you know, they want to be cool and so on. And they're like, you know, people before said, oh, cannabis would make you, you know, crazy, jump out of the building, you commit suicide. And they took it and they didn't do that. And so then they start questioning, like I said, rightly so, the, all the you know people saying, oh, this is horrible. And then some of them get into that trap that, in fact, they do develop you know, depression-like, anxiety-like disorders, psychosis, and so on. But I think teens, by that very nature, and because it's, so, it's everywhere around them. I live in New York City. I love New York. You walk down certain streets in New York you get high from just amount of, of, you know, cannabis <laughs> smoke that's there. And this is a city where everybody frowns on everyone else if they smoke cigarettes, you know? So there has been such a, I call this pendulum shift of cannabis being horrible. You're going to die from the, can, you know, and then now cannabis being said, you know, it can cure all. 
And I think that this is where it, in society that it's not so bad. And then the kids, I do think that for teens today and all of us, it's a very stressful time. Teens are going through a lot and there are not that many outlets for them. And so when you have available a, a drug and they don't realize how potent it is and that, it, yes, it's not like their, their grandmother's cannabis. And then they get trapped into it. So I think many people are just, you know, I, I know people hate the term self-medicate, but I think that there's definitely high stress for teens, high stress, high accessibility to these. And that combination makes it easier. So do you believe given the um, high potency of THC in cannabis today that it deserves to be in the same conversation as far as the addictive nature of it is things like cocaine, heroin, et cetera? About 30% of people who use cannabis in you know the last year or so will develop a cannabis use disorder. And that's actually similar to the numbers of um, when you look at who develops a cocaine use disorder or, or opiate use disorder. It's, you know, before we would say cannabis is not as addictive though as heroin and cocaine, but it's because the number of people using cannabis is so much more than use cocaine and, 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 and heroin. So that's why you get this higher, the number that's equal. I would definitely say that, you know, individuals using these high potency THC, you are getting into that range of much higher addiction vulnerability because there is no way our, our endogenous, our natural cannabinoid receptors, they were never meant to be hit with such a hard hammer. And we know that addiction risk increases as the concentration of the active substance that, you know, associated with reward increases. It's well documented. That is not controversial. And it's the controversy is that, yes, there are a lot of cannabis products. So not all of them are the 70, 90%. But the majority of them are way over the 4%. So that is where the, the issue is. So the addiction risk definitely has increased, which is shocking to me. Because in the beginning, it wasn't that I thought that, you know, cannabis would ever be considered in the same breath as cocaine and opioids in regard to um, addiction risk. But we have made the products in such a manner that it is getting to a level that we need to consider. And I'm not saying that we should reschedule, you know, um, cannabis in, in, in any way, shape or form, or again, go back to criminalizing and locking people up. because That's not a way to treat um, people who have a disorder. But I think people do need to understand they're not taking a benign drug. People want to compare it to alcohol. Alcohol is not great either. But, you know, it's like, but, you know, it's like, so... I don't like to compare. I just like to look at each of them individually in terms of what are some of the health risks and what are some of the health benefits. And as a society, we try to balance those. So if a parent's listening to this and they've been saying to themselves with their kid who's in high school that's been using marijuana, well, at least they're not drinking. You should say that they need to change the way they look at that situation, right? Absolutely. Because we know, and the records again, you know, your motor coordination when you have consumed cannabis, you are you shouldn't get behind the the wheel of a car. The, it's the same thing. Your cognition is impacted. I know that a number of young women today they're like, okay, they're afraid of you know date rape with alcohol, so they're like, oh, let, we'll use cannabis instead. It still impacts on your cognition. So I think that there is a little night, you know naive way of thinking that alcohol is way worse than cannabis. But as we talked about before, it's not the same drug. And they're comparing cannabis from, you know, 40 years ago to alcohol, which I think is, it's, it's absurd. So we need to look at where we are today and how can we educate the public about the health risks. But also, as I said, you know, many people are looking in research us including about health benefits. But trust me, the health benefits, we're not looking at any cannabis that is in the same THC concentration 
as what people are consuming today and especially teens. Right. Because I've heard you say that oftentimes or something to this effect that when people think of cannabis and the benefits, they're thinking of things like CBD and stuff and that like marijuana and THC gets looped into all of that and it can often confuse people, correct? Correct. And I, I really hope that our society, we stop probably saying cannabis and really start talking about cannabinoids because many people will say, oh, I use cannabis and you know it alleviated my anxiety. When I asked them, what was it? It was actually cannabidiol. So CBD is very different from THC. THC, the, the high, you know, a lot of the cognitive effects, the motor effects that we see comes from THC when people consume cannabis. In those that are CBD and predominantly, you know, no, with no THC, CBD doesn't, it's not addictive. It doesn't make you feel high. Um, it doesn't have impacts, negative impact on your cognition to, you know, short-term memory loss. You're not having that. You're not also having motor issues. So it's really important that we 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 are clear and so that parents and teens and there's a teenager said, oh he went to a party and had CBD and got so high. And I'm like, you did not have CBD. You know, he thought he got, you know, it was CBD he was consuming. I'm saying it must have either been laced with something else. And CBD had certain concentrations itself. Obviously it has some anti-anxiety properties. And again, people might think, oh, that may be getting me high. That's, uh, but it's the anti-anxiety property. Talk about the endocannabinoid system. Am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then what it's responsible for in the brain, why ingesting, smoking, you know, eating various forms of THC marijuana is so appealing to that. And then talk about if you could, because I've heard you talk about this, like some natural ways that we could tap into that same system um, that could give people like a similar feeling, you know, things like meditation, I think I've heard you talk about. Yeah. So, you know, our endocannabinoid system consists of the receptors to which THC binds, for example, but also it's not there for cannabis. It's not there for THC. It was there for our endogenous, you could say, cannabis ligands, these chemicals. And these chemicals are much lower in their, uh, in the, I would lack of the word just because of your audience, like the potency with which they would bind to these cannabinoid receptors. So when we, we consume a lot of cannabis, our cannabinoid receptors actually um, go down, right? And so the cannabinoid receptors, they regulate our endogenous cannabinoid system. They're very powerful they're there for maintaining homeostasis in the brain. So when you think about the endogenous cannabinoid system, they regulate how cells communicate. And if something is too high, it kind of helps to bring it down. If something is too low, it helps to bring it up. So we maintain normal, and I'm going to emphasize normal balance, normal homeostasis. So when we impact on our cannabinoid receptors, and also the more cannabis you take, the more you impact the natural endocannabinoid ligands that are synthesized, that are made. So you, you're impacting on your natural system, even though you say you're, you know, I'm taking because it's natural. So the question is, can you, what is it that modulates our endogenous cannabinoid system so you don't need to take cannabis or other drugs? And, you know, I'm horrible at meditation. I'm not good <laughs> at all. You know, but there are definitely things in which people, um, how do we bring ourselves back to homeostasis is basically it. How do we blunt the stress responses that we feel in life? And that's where our endogenous cannabinoid system, it does help in modulating stress, the normal stress response. So it is when people, mindfulness, meditation, what are the things that people can do to naturally bring themselves back in homeostasis? It means that you're you are engaging your natural endocannabinoid system because that is what mediates it. So for me, I think the earlier we can even teach kids about mindfulness and meditation, it's less that they're gonna go and try these drugs that will that they're trying to use to artificially do that. So bringing the body was built or the brain was built to put things in balance, put things, you know, so, and that's a huge aspect of the endocannabinoid system of normalizing when things um, go off, 
but just on a regular level, communications between you know um, the our the cells to keep us in balance. If I put it in a general bigger you know perspective like that, I can go very minutia, but you know not going to go into to that for your audience. So if somebody's listening to this, and let's just say they've been using. And again, we're talking about cannabis, we're talking about THC and marijuana, if they've been using it for for a period of time, and they're looking to bring themselves back to a level of of homeostasis, do you believe it's still possible for our brain to still grow and heal through neuroplasticity, even though the potency of, even though the the marijuana today is, is way more potent with THC than it used to be? I absolutely believe it. I think when I started down a path in neuroscience, you know, I, I didn't start studying addiction to in, in the beginning, but as I started to look at the neurobiology of it, you know, many people and many people with a substance use disorder, they say, you know, and I hate this adage of once an addict, always an addict. And being a neuroscientist and studying the brain related to addiction, I know that's false. And the reason I say that is one of the things that our data and, and other people have also shown is that what's happening to the brain when you have a substance use disorder and use high potency cannabis, we're changing these tags on our DNA called these epigenetic tags. So epigenetics, and you asked the question earlier, Doug, about the environment. The environment can impact on, we, we inherit the DNA sequence of our, from our parents, so genetics. And that determines the, how your cells um, communicate, obviously how we look and so on. The environment, and THC is one of them, and high-dose THC, can impact how the cells communicate, and they impact it by these epigenetic tags that are put on the brain, so it remembers. It remembers the high-potency effect, and so when you use THC again later, even if you you know hadn't had it for a while, you're much more sensitive to, like I said before, the cognitive-impairing effects, the anxiety effects. Epigenetic mechanisms are reversible. You can't reverse your genetics. You can reverse epigenetic modifications that are put on the tags in your in the cells. And so for me, I know it's reversible because of what neuroscience has taught me. We, However, in the cancer field, cancer is a disorder, I would say, of epigenetics gone awry. And there are a lot of medications developed to normalize cells that are no longer you know, that have gone rogue. We can do the same in neuroscience. We just haven't completely found ways to do it in a safe manner. But because what THC is changing are these epigenetic tags, we can reverse them. And you can reverse them even with behavior. We know that. So environment can put tags on, but another environment can help to remove those detrimental tags. And so for me, it is reversible. And I, I do think that we will be able to find ways to help people, whether it's through behavior, whether it's through meditation, whether it is through, you know, positive aspects in their life, whether it's through another medication, we will be able to reverse that. I'd love to get into ways and behavior modifications that people can look into in order to reverse. But, but before we do that, is your confidence um, in the brain's ability to reverse itself and heal? as um, as high in the developing brain with kids, because you've mentioned the risk of kids who smoke it when their brain is developing. Are you as confident that people in that situation can reverse this as well? Are you as confident in people in that situation being able to, re being able to reverse it as you are with, like, say, adults who start using later in life? You know, that's a, an important question. So we can reverse it in our animal models. So, for example, I also study prenatal effects of cannabis and both in, in people and in our animal models. And we see similar things in their kids and their offspring. We can even, you know, the data shows we can predict their kids' behavior based on the placental changes, you know, um, from in utero placenta to their, their behavior later. And in animals, we can change that epigenetic mark and change their behavior. We can't do that. I go in into the brain and I do that with our animal models. I'm not going to do that with humans. So it's it may be possible. Um, definitely, you're right in that the later the exposure, the, the more that we can change those modifications. So there are two different things. I talked about, you could say, we can reverse. We may not need to reverse. We just may need to 
um, again, homeostasis. We may, you can say we reverse one thing or you can bring up something else. So the question is how perhaps early developmental effects of, of THC, we may not be able to do, use the same mechanisms as we do say in adults, but we can then strengthen some other parts of the system. And that I think is equally a, a strategy that we need to explore more. But as I said, I do think that even though the developing brain obviously sets the trajectory long term, I the neuroscientists in me, based on what I see, I do think that it lends itself still to be able to be modified. And so I'm optimistic in that manner, but it may be two different ways in which we go about um, it's it's the tree. A tree is born and it starts bending. Can you then push, put it back towards this? It's going to be a different thing that you need to do. And so I think that strategies that we use for kids will need to think about that um, probably differently for, than adults. So I want to close the loop on the stuff with kids. And then we're going to, I want to get into like the behavior modification and, and the systems that we can strengthen in order to help re- reverse and recover from um, an addiction to cannabis. So if parents are listening to this and they're like, well, what do I do? Like I can try and talk to my kids. I can go to different websites for resources, but then they go to school and they're immersed with all this stuff. They're on social media. It's in, it's all over the place in front of them. Like, what do I do? Uh, do you have any advice for a parent that might be listening to this to be able to navigate this in the best way possible? You know, it is very difficult I think to be a parent of teenagers or even younger. I mean, kids are starting younger and younger to you know, experiment with cannabis. And to me, the earlier you can start talking to your children openly about um, drugs, the better. And when I say that, it comes back to at the dining table or the and the every day, what are the things, how do you build a communication with your kids? So it's not a judgmental thing. It's just about knowledge. It's the same thing that you you need to do for everything. But I think drugs are so critical today. And I one thing I will emphasize, I didn't say earlier, but parents don't realize, you know, unfortunately, even there are people putting fentanyl into cannabis today so that your children are much more at risk because how do you get the next generation addicted quicker? So it is important that the more kids are kind of trained to really be mindful and make their own decisions, whether it's about how do I, what color socks do I wear today? Have them to empower. So the more that kids are empowered, the less they're vulnerable to other people, you know, do, that they care about what other people think, even their friends. But to me, it is about communication. Um, obviously, not everyone can do that. But to me, it's also changing, helping your kids change their environment. You know, if your child has a particular interest in a sport, try to encourage that. If they love music in the context, try to encourage things that can help to move them away from just, you know, either a particular group of friends that may be using a lot, giving them exposure to many different things in their lives, but having open conversations, but not going to lie, it is difficult. And it's difficult because um, drugs are so abundant and especially potent drugs are so abundant that can get your child addicted much quicker. Do you think that part of the solution also has to be something within the schools where there needs to be some sort of constructive, productive class education on stuff like this? Because I know they tried it with like D.A.R.E., which yeah. was a failed you know, very, very um, badly, right? Um, what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, I absolutely do. But again, it comes back to let's empower the kids. Um, um, We have a program here at Mount Sinai um, where um, Dr. Shilpa Taufik, we work in the community with two schools that the kids have had traumatic, let's just put it, you know, um, lives. And we bring psychosocial um, therapy to these kids. People said, oh, the kids would never sign up. We're booked. It's about the the Department of Education 
realizing that our community is very different today and that school provides an important environment for them to get the behavioral tools that they need to succeed. But like you said, even education and the earlier to start education, but it's empowerment again, have the kids do the experiments. Don't have people come in and scare them, say, oh, this is your, your, you know, your brain is going to explode if you take this drug and so on. Work with scientists like myself. We develop experiments, have the kids be part of that so they can answer the questions themselves that they say, are you sure that this does this and this? When we empower kids, they're amazing. So I really think that the Department of Education has a bigger role to play. And it's not because it's their fault. It's just that our society has changed, but we have not changed how we educate kids. And parents, I agree with you, cannot do it alone. It is a whole community effort. Also, community leaders can, you know, again, going back after school programs in certain communities that don't have the money to, you know, send their kids to this and that program. What do we build in the communities to have safe spaces for kids just to be kids? And, and educate them about drugs in a manner that's not talking down to them, but having them be part of the conversation. It's all about empowerment, and everybody along that path needs to be a part of it. So when you talk about experiment, do you just mean like bringing these kids together collectively and meeting with somebody like you and having you talk with them you know, at the same level about cannabis and its effects and stuff? I mean, you're not, right? Well, it's not that they will come to our lab. We do have some, we do have summer programs and some kids do. We do accept kids to come in during the summer. Mount Sinai also have a program throughout the school year and they actually come into the lab and do experiments, but we can do um, virtual experiments where they can, you know, this is a a research question that they would like and they investigate virtually the answers to that. Again, it's not me coming just to talk to them but it's how can we have them be part of the, the conversation and come up with their own answers. And, and that's what I think we're not doing enough is realizing, especially teenagers, they're smart, but we haven't treated them in that way. They can be part of the conversation, but a lot of them are hurting. So make sure that in the school system that we can give it to the educators. They have enough to do. You need to bring in the therapists with this, who have the psychosocial, we have psychologists, psychiatrists for those who meet a certain level, um, so, um, social workers um, in the program that we have developed. That it's, it's a community effort. Teachers cannot be the social workers. They cannot be the psychologists, the psychiatrists. But you can make a team for the school that provides that. So kids are in a safe space where they need help for different things. Simple. So getting back to some of the solutions for recovering from cannabis addiction, cannabis use disorder, what are some of the systems that you believe somebody should work on strengthening? If somebody, let's just say, is like day one in in recovery and they're like, all right, I want to do everything I can to modify my behavior and change so that I'm not seeking out substances like cannabis to help me numb pain, manage stress? What kind of activities should they be focusing on and stuff like that? You know, that is, that's a challenge I think because everyone is so different. And I think you have to go with what are the things that bring you joy? For some people, it is about, I do think I'm also, in addition to meditation is bad, I'm bad with, I'm not going to say go run. You know, I'm horrible at running, but for some people, they actually love running and our natural endorphin system is an important part as well. How do we, um, if you've depleted something, how do you fill it back? And so to me, it is knowing that it is one day at a time, but positive things that come into your life, how do you try to bring back natural joy? How do you try to bring back things that alleviate the anxiety. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's important that people understand that they're not alone and it is to find whether it is a group therapy or groups may have common interests or individual therapy in order to help them. I think one of the things being isolated is, is usually 
not a great way to overcome, you know, substance use disorders. And that's no different for cannabis use disorder. Finding the positive people, making sure to try to avoid those with whom you had used before with, those are cues and triggers to use again. So, you know, it's important to also be honest with oneself. Why am I going down this path? And, you know, it is, uh, it is challenging, but it's possible. So many, as you, many people have done it. So when people think again about addiction that, you know, you can never get out of it, that's not true. Do you think people are better off given the, the sometimes the shame and stigma that can come with like cannabis addiction because for so long it was seen as this lower tier drug that they're better off going into a cannabis specific like 12 step group or support group or do you think that it's more accepted now in like traditional 12 steps I think it's more accepted now and I think because they have seen the shift of these high potency THC that people are you know um, getting addicted faster, they're they're showing many of the same signs as other substance use disorders. So I think, to me, it's to start with whatever is available. It's just to take that first step, and then you go to you know as you go down this path, you start to go more and more into the one that um, you see that works more for you. Trust me, there's no disorder on the that we ever say that there's one treatment for and that's it. Yet still, for substance use disorder, we think oh. You know, it's just this and you'll be fine. No, everyone will be different. Everyone got into this path, into this disorder in a different way. And to get out of it, you have to realize you will get out of it also. You don't have to follow every single thing that everyone else did. There are different programs. And if one doesn't work for you, try the other. If this doesn't work, try the other. In cancer, we don't give everyone the same cancer treatment because it's very different. Everyone is different. So know that, you know, if one thing didn't work, you're not a failure. It's that thing that didn't work for you. Something else will work. One of the challenges I think people have is they get super excited to start this recovery journey. And then all of a sudden, the the novelty of that kind of wears off. And they start to get a craving. They start to think about like, oh, maybe I can go back and, and use and, and do it recreationally. Um, and that can become hard. And then and as a result, people end up going back to it, what do you recommend people do when they get like a craving or they get some sort of thought where they're like, maybe I should just go back and, and try it um, differently this time? Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, again, like many disorders, most disorders are relapsing disorders and there's not a shame, but you have to, as soon as you, you recognize these urges and are coming through, it is about, you know, reaching out to those people who can be honest and open. And, and also, again, when you're isolated, when you isolate yourself, that makes it worse. So again, do the things that can give you more access to people, to people, who, I said, in a positive manner. It is going to be normal. When you realize it's normal that these thoughts will come in, it is normal. Even for people who are, I'm addicted, you know, to it is to chocolate potato chips. I'm not going to eat this. Or, and you, it is normal. We are human. It is what you put as buffers to you for yourself. When you know that you are starting to slip towards the edge, what buffers do you put there? You identify, you have those buffers in place before you even get to the edge. So like I said, the therapist, your physician, um, whichever physician you may have, whether it's a psychiatrist or whatever disorders you might have, the friends, the family members who you know are positive, it's getting people who believe in you and won't give up on you and that you don't give up on yourself. But to me, it's to do the things that gave you give you pleasure that are not drug things so that when you do get close to the edge, they're already there that you can that can help you from going over that edge. Shifting gears just for a second, there's a lot of people obviously that are struggling with opiate addiction now. And there's been this massive opioid epidemic now for years. And one of the things I've seen is that people will say, well, smoking marijuana or ingesting marijuana is a great form of harm reduction. And then based, and then I've also talked to some experts that are like, no, it's, it's not, you know, if it works for somebody and it's legal, they're doing it legally and 
blah, blah, blah. Great. But you can't just paint this as this universal way for people to reduce harm from opiate addiction. Like, what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah. You know, again, people, I think, think that we have all the answers. We don't know if cannabis, um, and especially this high potency THC cannabis, is definitely not the answer for opiate addiction. However, cannabis with low potency THC, yes, you're not going to overdose as the risk is for opioids. We have a, we are, as you said, in an opioid, opioid epidemic still, you know, 130 people still die daily. So we do need to protect people and all the harm reduction strategies must be considered. But it's important to know that just taking, consuming these high potency THC is not the answer either. It's still to do it within a, uh, their harm reduction programs. There's still a lot of research being done in regard to cannabis in terms of harm reduction strategy for opioid addiction. So we'll see whether or not you know, they work and for who they may work for. That's another thing, as I said earlier, everybody won't um, be able to come out of their substance use disorder in, in the same exact treatment. So cannabis may work for some individuals, but I'm going to emphasize decrease the amount of the cannabis, of the THC potency. We also know in some research that people think that they need the high potency THC. Some of the low potency THC that has CBD, cannabidiol in it, actually, it would, can be better for you than the high potency can help. Our research that we had shown many years ago, and that's why it started people that, oh, cannabis can help with opioid addiction. It was CBD. We showed first in our animal models, it decreased their heroin seeking behavior. We moved it to humans in small studies. We showed that it could decrease their Q induced craving and their stress response. And now we're conducting a larger study on that in the real world because before people would come to our labs. And now we're going to look at them in their real world. So we will see whether or not CBD can be developed as a treatment for opiate use disorder, but it's CBD, not cannabis. So again, you know, you need to educate yourself about what you're putting into your body and what you think you're, you're using to alleviate your, your disorder. Cannabis, high potency cannabis so far has not been proven to, to treat, cure anything. So it can exacerbate all the things that you are trying to alleviate. Last thing I want to ask you is if a parent's listening to this and they're wondering like, is my kid, you know, smoking cannabis? Are they doing edibles? Are they taking, like, are they ingesting it in any way? Like, I don't know. Kids can be very secretive and hide things a lot. Like what are some of the telltale signs that, you know, a kid is, is using something like cannabis? Cannabis and especially edibles are very difficult because it's not like you are, you know, people used to smell the cannabis and of course that horrible sk skunk smell if your kids come in, you know, then you know. But these edibles, a lot of parents don't know. And again, you know, it's, do you want to be the parent to have your kid give your urine test? I think that that'll be, you know, damaging of relationships. And it's about, again, having the open discussions with your kids. Like everything else is... Are they sleeping too much in the context of, you know, not um, fulfilling going to school? The teachers know that they are, you know, you know, they're, you know, they're um, a lot of teachers, I will tell you, tell us there's so many of their kids are high in, in class. Kids come to school high. So how can they ever learn? And this is one of the things when your kid, um, your child is leaving. Um, do you drop your kid off and you see them going to school? Are they taking things that you see that they're, you know, they're, they're lethargic in a manner that's not about, you know, just being a teenager, <laughs> um, you know, sleeping. There are a lot of things you see change of behavior. The change of behavior is a huge issue. And especially, you know, things that they can hardly, you know, hear you, listen to you in terms of cognition, they're lethargic. Those are things to start and to have open conversations also with the the teachers of your, you know, your, your children's teachers, because it's not, they usually see a lot in, with the kids more than you do. So that type of relationship also is important to try and gauge. Is your child going down a certain path with the drugs? What are some of the symptoms of psychosis? When, when people think about psychosis, you know, the hallucinations and you, and unfortunately it is like, you know, late adolescent, early adulthood, 
that is that vulnerable period when people, even without cannabis, you know, um, start to show if they're going to develop psychosis and schizophrenia type disorders. So, you know, a lot of it is paranoia. They are, you know, they, they may see something, hear something that is not real. And you, it is quite vivid and that it scares a lot of parents, especially, you know, with high potency THC, they have kids who they bring to the emergency room. And it's really important indeed to bring your child to the emergency room when they are disoriented in such a manner that they are, they are seeing things they're, you know, they are the paranoia. You can't even get close to them, the paranoia. And it's usually this acute short-term period that starts and, you know, they can cycle through, but it's really critical to bring them to an emergency um, uh, department room department. Dr. Hurd, thank you so much for your time, for sharing your expertise, your research, and your wisdom. I think the audience is going to get a ton of value out of this conversation. I, you know, I really hope that everybody realizes that they're not alone. And it's in your your podcast, it's really important for us to have open discussions and and hopefully together we can the scientists, the teachers, the education, the parents um, can help to bring kids, you know, back. Thank you. Absolutely. And you're welcome. Thanks again for coming on. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, I really think you're going to like this video as well. I'll see you there.